Good morning and welcome to East Troy Bible Church. It's a beautiful Sunday morning on March 29th, 2020. Uh, if you're watching from home, we uh, welcome you and are grateful that you're with us. We appreciate the fact that you've taken some time to be intentional and made it a point to be part of this service today. We've got a wonderful service for you planned uh, and a beautiful music to, be, uh, to, be, to sing along with. And uh, to make it easier for you today, I've included underneath the YouTube the stream or in the Facebook, lie, uh, the Facebook uh, stream uh, post in the group, you'll find uh, a, a little kit there for you. The first thing in the kit is a song sheet, a PDF of a song sheet, and you'll be able to follow along with all the lyrics. The second thing you'll find is an, is an event page that we've created for the service that has all sorts of information. It has announcements, it has uh, Bible readings, it has our memory verse from Psalm 91, uh, it has um, our scripture for the sermon text, as well as it has uh, the outline for the sermon itself and notes there. Uh, I'd love it if you would go to that kit, open it up, get the song sheet ready, and, uh, and then also that you would get that live event page out and just be able to look through that and be, uh, be equipped for the, for, for the service today. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I'd love it if you would uh, uh, join me as I begin the service now and read from Psalm 92, verses 1 through 5. It's a song for the Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. Let's pray as we begin the service. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time to get together and worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to do this as a, as a church family, even though we're spread across uh, the countryside. Thank you, to, uh, thank you to, uh, uh, for so much for the technology that you've given us to be able to do this and uh, to be together in this way. Lord, I pray for those who are in need and those who have many uh, needs for comfort and care. Uh, we pray for those who are struggling with fear. Uh, Lord, we just pray that this service would, uh, would help alleviate some of those worries and concerns as we focus on you and make you our trust. Give us the perfect, perfect peace that we need. Help us to fix our mind and our trust upon you. So Lord, we pray that you would come and uh, work in the hearts of our minds and lives, even, even though we might be sitting in our living room. Uh, Lord, create a sense of unity and community, even within our own home and family. Strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. Good morning, and welcome to East Troy Bible Church's second online service. Uh, we're so excited to worship with you this morning through song, studying the word, prayer. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to start our morning with scripture. We'll be reading Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2, and 16 and 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Today there's no reason 
Continuing today um, by reading Psalm 31. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. to be singing a new song to the East Troy Bible Church called He Will Hold Me Fast. I think it's really um, fitting for just this time that we are living in where there's a lot of um, uncertainty and insecurity even. So we just have to um, trust that he holds us fast and um, that's all through Jesus Christ. So we will be singing this song twice because it is a new one. You're not here physically with us to worship. Um, for the first time for, through the song, so we'll be singing it twice. 
And to tie along with that, I just want to read Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. time now that you have heard the verses and the chorus. Um, so please join us in singing the song one more time. Christ will hold me. 
Thank you, Caroline and Grace and Rob and Joel. Appreciate your ministry today, and thank you that uh, you could come out and, and, and be with us today. Thank you as well for being with us this morning and, um, and worshiping with us. Thank you uh, for uh, opening your home to the East Troy Bible Church today. Uh, I think before we begin uh, looking into God's Word that we should take a moment and pray and ask the Lord to be with a, a few people in our church family. Uh, as we know, uh, Paulette Beckler had surgery this week, and uh, we're praying for her. We're praying for um, Judy Williamson, who is recovering from surgery as well. Our missionaries, Randy and Tracy Wise, were in a car accident, and, and uh, Tracy's still suffering from the injuries related to that accident, and so we want to be praying for her as well. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day, this chance to worship you together as a church family, uh, apart from one another and yet together in spirit. Lord, we pray for these needs uh, that we've just mentioned, as well as, Lord, the many needs that might be represented in our congregation. We understand that there may be fear, and anxiety, anger, disappointment, fatigue. There may be spiritual needs and emotional needs that go beyond our comprehension, Lord, and I pray that you would meet those needs. Though we aren't together, your spirit is with us, and you know the needs that are within our church family. I pray that you would minister today to the people. May this be a moment of rest from the worries and cares of this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today we continue in uh, our study through Matthew. And um, we're going to be in the end of Matthew 23, verses 37, through Matthew 24, verse 36. Uh, and I would love it if you would just take out that little guide that I sent you. Um, electronically and see that that might be a help to you. Uh, I was just wondering what you thought about the days that we're experiencing right now. Are you overwhelmed? Have you just shut down? I know the times are crazy, right? And it's easy to feel discouraged, insane, <laughs> bit OCD, worried, angry, political, and even maybe even rebellious. And if you're like me and you're employed, you probably feel like you're working too much. And if you are employed, you may also feel like you're working not enough. I'm exhausted, but some of you wish you could be exhausted. And you're concerned instead about your work 
and or struggling through a new kind of schooling or you're grieving over lost opportunities, class trips, commencement, proms, banquets, sports, kids sports all the way through pro sports are, are canceled, that your plan, plans have completely changed. It's very difficult. And the news seems to get worse day by day. More cases, death is on the rise, both the young and the older suffering. And if you dwell on it, it really becomes overwhelming. And many of us probably are going through phases of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But probably, my guess is most of us are still in the denial phase in America. We don't really believe it's happening. After all, a lot of you are sitting in your jammies at home drinking a cup of coffee, and it feels kind of nice, but it doesn't seem real. Some of you are in flat out fear. You hear news of hospitals rejecting patients, not enough ventilators. You hear reports from New York or Europe. You see videos, and, and it's be, be very, it becomes very frightening. And, and we haven't really faced a terrifying situation like this since World War II as a world. Like most things, fear is heightened in the unknown when we don't understand and we don't have solutions and answers. There's so much unknown about this current crisis that we're in. But the more we know, the more we know what to do. And fear seems to get less somehow when, when we understand what we're dealing with. Knowing what to do makes a bad situation manageable. Here in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew chapter, the end of chapter 23 and chapter 24, Matthew's Gospel is about the good news. But in our chapters today, it's about bad news. Really, really bad news. But the good news is, Jesus knew all about it. He was not overwhelmed by it, and he had a plan about it. And he gave his followers encouraging words. If you turn to Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, you'll see the beginning of this bad news. Jesus is lamenting over Israel. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple in verse 1 of chapter 24. And he was going away. And when his disciples came to, to him to point out the buildings of the temple, but he answers them, You see all these, do you not? Um, truly I say to you, there will not be one not be left here one stone upon another that will not be torn down. I want to talk you through some of the things that Jesus not only does but says in this text. And the first thing we see Jesus do is he weeps. In verse 37, Jesus gives an indictment and weeps. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills its prophets. Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus weeps? He cares about the needs of men. Mankind and Jesus wept over the tomb of Lazarus. And he comes, as he comes into the city to Jerusalem, he begins to weep over the city. Jesus is God, and yet he also is human. Jesus has emotions. He created those emotions and he feels that. I think that it's a comforting thing to know that the, the things that we struggle with, the, the griefs that Jesus can sympathize with those things because he himself was a man and that went through those things and struggled with grief and sorrow, just like you and I do. And so when J Jesus was faced with bad news, this bad news, he wept. It's comforting to know that Jesus cares at his heart. Listen to Jesus in Luke chapter 19. 
And when he drew near to the city, he, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So why did Jesus weep? Well, Matthew outlines here Jesus in Jesus' words that Jesus, uh, that Jesus indicted the people of Israel. Then he laments over them, and then he judges them. <laughs> he proclaims words of judgment. Now, in the previous chapters, um, he's been arguing with the, the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and he just in the last chapter, chapter 23, has pronounced seven um, words of, of condemnation, seven woes, seven curses, if you will, over the Pharisees, the religious leaders, because of their obstinate, hypocritical hearts. But now he turns his eyes towards Jerusalem, the city itself, and the people of Jerusalem, and he says that they are the ones that cause him to weep. Why? Because in verse 37, it says that of 20, chapter 23, that the city kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. Just as in the previous chapters, Jesus proved that the religious leaders had failed because they didn't listen to God and they rejected the truth. They ignored and killed the prophets of old and they had even done it to John the Baptist and now even in a few days they were going to do it to Jesus. They were going to crucify him. So Jesus indicted the religious leaders in the past chapters, but now he includes the city of Jerusalem and the people. It was the people, after all, in the next few days that would yell, crucify, crucify. And Jesus wept and lamented their unbelief. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. It recalls to mind the, the words in Psalm 91 written by Moses during another bad time when he says, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence or coronavirus <laughs> that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. And we hold that uh, psalm to be true. In fact, it's in our uh, worship guide today as a, as, a, as a psalm to memorize. But he's saying that, he's lamenting that these people can no longer experience that protection that God pr had provided them in the past all the way back to the days of Moses. That protection is going away. He turned from this indictment and lament and pronounces judgment on them. He says in verse 38, see it? He says, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple and was going away. Verse one of chapter 24. Jesus gives two prophetic judgments over the people of Israel. The first one is that God's house, the temple, will be desolate. Desolate means absent, empty. God was going to leave that place. And what it would do is it would create a, a, a loss of protection from evil. No longer would God gather his people under his wings of protection. And the second thing is a loss of the blessing of the Messiah because Jesus leaves. Romans 1 22 describes judgment, the judgment of God. It describes mankind who claimed to be wise, but became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Then, therefore, God gave them up. And then in verse 26 of, Matthew, of Romans 1, for this reason, God gave them up. And then verse 28 of chapter 1, it says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up. Three times Paul said that God's judgment was to give people up to something else other than him. Often we confuse the symptom with the disease, the consequences for the cause. Plague, sin, cultural chaos, social disorder, sexual deviance are not the judgment of God. They are the symptoms of God's judgment. What is God's judgment? God's judgment is to decide to depart from mankind, to give people up, to turn a blind eye. Matthew inserted a chronological piece here that should not be lost. After Jesus pronounces his indictment and laments over Jerusalem, Matthew notes in verse 1 of chapter 24, then Jesus left the temple. 
This is the saddest moment in the history of the Jewish nation. Jesus left, hope left, promise left. The wings of God no longer covered his people. The saddest moment, more sad, more sorrowful than the Holocaust, if you can believe that. More sorrowful than the exiles, more sorrowful than the wicked kings of old, more sorrowful than being left in the desert for 40 years in the days of Moses, more sorrowful than the fall of Jerusalem and the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70. This is the most sad moment in Jewish history when Jesus leaves the temple. He says a, a second prophetic word that God's house will be destroyed. When his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple, it says that the disciples who were there in Mark, that the disciples were Peter, James, John, and Andrew. These four men came up to Jesus and asked him questions. And as they, were, as they were leaving the temple and going to the Mount of Olives, they noticed the beauty of the temple itself. And they remarked at it. And then Jesus sits them down on the top of the, the mountain, looking over the temple. You could hear the bleeding of the sheep being prepared for sacrifice. You could hear the people and the noise. You could see the, the, the temple in the, in, the, in the foreground or in the background, I should say. And the disciples mentioned it. The temple was an architectural wonder of the ancient world. It, it took almost 50 years to build. It was beautiful and white stone and gold. And uh, Josephus remarked that it looked like a snow-capped mountain as you approach the city. But Jesus answered and said, and he pointed it to this, this temple and said, you see these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus predicts the de destruction of the temple. But then it, in typical Jesus style, Jesus provides a promise. In the middle of this, prophetic um, word of judgment, he inserts a promise. Verse 39 says of chapter 23, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word until is very important, until. Jesus snuck a promise of his return into that judgment. The Jewish people clearly understood the, the, the first Messiah was going to come, but they, they didn't understand Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant who would, was described as a man of sorrows, smitten by God, afflicted, pierced, grief-stricken, crushed for sin, and suffering for sin. So they expected the king of Jerusalem to, re to come, but not as a lamb to be slain. So in the, in the judgment, Jesus reassured his disciples with the promise of his return when they sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from Psalm 118. You will not see me until this song is sung. The song is sung usually at the Feast of Booths or the Passover. It was sung in Matthew 21 as Jesus entered the temple on the donkey as they sang it to him. It makes me think, it makes me wonder if Jesus isn't hinting at a time at which he will return. And then Jesus gives some warnings. In chapter 24, verses three, three through eight, the disciples ask three basic questions and then Jesus gives two in pieces of instruction. And they're, they're really the cornerstone or the, or the most important words that you might hear today. The disciples asked three questions. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, he began to talk to them. And they say, tell us when these things, meaning the destruction of the temple, will be. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So they ask two questions in one there. And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine and earthquakes in various places. All these are about the beginning of the birth pains. To ask these three questions, when will the temple be destroyed? What are the signs of the end of the age? And what are the signs of the return of the Messiah? And that's what the rest of the balance of the passage is about. 
in Matthew 24. Jesus, though, wants to give them two basic instructions, two words of encouragement as they consider these trying times that Jesus predicted. First, in verse 4, don't be led astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will lead many astray. During difficult times, there are people who will come along aside of others and try to use the fear and use the trouble to draw them away from Christ. They will, they will um, be false. They'll teach falsehood. They'll want to appeal to your fears and make you want to make you feel good and, and, and want, to, want, to, want to help you psychologically or whatever instead of leading you to Christ. And Jesus says, don't be led astray. Don't put your attention on something or someone other than, than, the, than me and my word. So don't be led astray. That's going to be the common thing that's going to occur during times of stress and tribulation is people will come along and try to sway your attention from Jesus. The second thing is don't be alarmed. In verse 6, see that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, these things. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet. For the nation will rise against nation, the kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. These things are going to happen. Don't be alarmed. They're normal. Chapter 24, Jesus begins to prophesy then and answer the questions. The first question was, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And, and actually, Matthew doesn't deal with the question at all. He goes to the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. Um, Matthew's goal is to present Jesus as the King of Kings and the Son of Man. So he puts all of his attention on the fact that Jesus is returning and that he fulfills Old Testament prophecy. The chronology of the destruction of the temple actually is captured by Luke, who synthesizes all the apostles' words and rec records them in Luke chapter 21, verses 24. And so they ask, when are these things going to take place? And Jesus says in Luke 21, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, in siege in other words, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of the city depart and let not those who are in the country enter the city because these, days of these are the days of vengeance in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes for in those days, for there will be a great distress upon the land and the wrath to his people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. Now, the destruction that Jesus describes of the temple and this siege around Jerusalem is different than the description of the temple that is desolated in Revelation. This is a, a prophecy of an actual event that was going to occur in the lives of the disciples. When Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, then desolation is at hand. There's great distress. These are the days of vengeance. There's wrath coming. People will fall by the edge of the sword. They're led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by Gentiles. Jesus gave them instructions then, get out of town, flee. And the Jewish believers did it. That destruction was horrifying. There was no stone left unturned. Against Caesar's orders, the temple was burned and the gold melted off the stone and into the ground. And they pried up all the, all the stones in order to retrieve that gold. The stones that were foundation stones to the Herod's temple were 3,600 cubic feet in size, massive. And yet they were removed. It's so thoroughly laid to the ground that, that Josephus said that you couldn't even tell that there was a city there. 1.1 million Jews, Josephus said, were killed. He said it was the Passover and there was a large crowd of people in the city. 1.1 million people were killed, young people, elderly. 
anybody that was left to uh, fit to, to, to go with the Romans were put into captivity. 97,000 people were put into captivity. Many of those went to the lions in the Colosseums for the entertainment of the culture. Many were put uh, enslaved in other parts of the uh, Roman Empire. They were forced to become gladiators, forced to become slaves. Matthew, I believe, here described the common era next in verse 9 that continues to today. Now, the people that were reading this text originally would have thought that the destruction of Jerusalem was the immediate context of the return of Christ. But now that time has gone by, we find ourselves 2,000 years later, we understand that God has a different plan. In verse 9, it describes the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by the nations, by all nations, for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because the lawlessness will be increased, the love of uh, many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. All these things have occurred. It's called a tribulation. And the tribulation, the curse, when we're outside of the protection of God, as it describes in Romans 1, we're going to experience these things. The power of the curse without the protection of God is devastating, horrifying, it's frightening. And it's what we're experiencing as a world today. This virus that we're experiencing now is part of this tribulation that's the aftermath of the fall of Jerusalem. It's what we're experiencing today. It says, after these things, then the end will come. It's a tribulation. Verses 9 through 14, as I see it, our description of our world today, however, they are similar to the following verses in verse 15 through 28. Verse 15 through 28 will seem like a repetition. Some might say that it's just an expansion of the text from before, that Jesus is just further illuminating what he just said. But in verse 9, it says that there's a tribulation. In verse 21, it says it's a great tribulation, meaning it's, it's, it's a tribulation on steroids. And then there's, in verse 29, it says after the tribulation, now, Jewish people, sustenance cultures, don't really care too much about time, but they care about events. And Jesus is trying to give them a sense of the events that will follow one another. There seems to be a progression of events of tribulation. So Jesus turns then and asks, answers the next two questions. The first question is, when is the end of the age? What are the signs of the end of the age? And the second question is, what are the signs of the return of Christ? The disciples were clearly aware that Jesus was going to come again. He had just said it. He says, he's coming back, and so they want to know when. They want to know what are the signs, what are the episodes before that happens. So verse 15 so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, now the abomination is not the one of Antiochus Epiphanes, and described it's greater than the, the, the desolation that, that amillennialists claim the zealots um, executed in the temple in AD 68. The abomination of desolation is significant. It's a significant event that is disgusting. And it occurs in a temple that doesn't yet exist. So there's a, there's a specific literal problem that that's Jesus is presenting to us today as we look at this for signs. There seems to be indicated here that there's another temple coming. And we know that in Israel today, whether you're a Zionist or not, or believe in Israel, the, the, the the, the uh, prophet promises of Israel uh, relevant for today. That's, that's not unseen here. But today we know that there's a temple in plan. Levites have been, uh, the Levites have been named. The, the council of the Sanhedrin has been developed. I've seen the council room itself. Um, the, the plans for the temple have been drawn up. I've seen those plans. 
on display in Israel. So there is a, a, a movement towards a, a modern and new temple. Anyway, whatever this temple is, it's a, again desecrated. Let Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. It sounds, sounds similar to the verses ahead earlier. In 17, it says, then the one who's on the housetop not to go down and take what is in his house. Let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. As, uh, and alas for the woman who's pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight and they may not be in the winter or in the Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. It's a great tribulation, a tribulation in steroids, such as not has been seen from the beginning of the world till now. In, in other words, there have been many terrible events that have, been, that have happened since A.D. 70, since the destruction of, of the temple that uh, exceed even in, in, in terror Holocaust being one of them. For then there'll be a great tribulation such as not has been from the beginning of the world till now. No, there will never be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead you astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. As for the lightning, as far as the lightning comes from the east as, and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So this would be a time of great devastation. It would be like, unlike any other time we've ever experienced. No time earlier in history ever will, com will, will ever compare It'll be worse than the world wars that we've experienced. This is a time of great fear. It is not the same time that's described by Jesus earlier in the passage. It's an expansion. It's an acceleration. It's an intensification of that experience that we are now having today. He then gives signs of the messianic return, his return, the signs of the Son of Man coming Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and of great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to another. Now, Jesus is using Old Testament language from Isaiah 13, Joel 2.10, and 31, Ezekiel 32.7, and Daniel 7. He knows that the people of Israel are well steeped. It's their go-to book, the Old Testament. They know this book. And so as he uses these, this language, they understand this language, and they recognize that Jesus is claiming to be the Son of Man, that he's claiming to, to be the, the Messiah, and that he's claiming to return. And he's going to return in great splendor and great power, but all the world will mourn. There's going to be a sudden, sudden interruption of the, old, of, the, of the tribulation with these Old Testament signs. There's going to be the appearance of the Son of Man, which is Daniel's term. There will be worldwide mourning because unbelievers will mourn as they suddenly recognize the consequence of their unbelief. And then there's going to be a gathering and rescuing in verse 31. Jesus says these things, though. He says, my words will not pass away. And this is his last word. He's given this prophecy. He's given this, the idea to his disciples of what's going to come. He's uh, reassuring them that, that they should not be alarmed that they should not turn away to false prophets and false teachers, that they should hold fast and, and endure in their faith, that they might, in their faith for Christ, that they might be rescued. But then he says, from a lesson from the fig tree, just like the fig tree uh, blooms in the spring, as you see these things occur, you'll know that my return is near. He says, truly this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. All these things refers back to the temple being destroyed. The words, all these things. And then he, he, he merges that with the, 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 the uh, prophecies of the Son of Man at the end of the age. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, 
and not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but only the Father. And the idea there is that even Jesus at this moment didn't understand fully the times and the days, but he knew the events. And these events were to provide a lesson for the disciples that Jesus, his word, would not pass away. Everything seems so temporary, doesn't it? Reach into the pantry, things are expired. Um, milk goes bad. Buy a new truck. Three years later, the wheel wells are rusted. Summer begins, and the next moment you blink your eyes and it's August. So things are temporary, and Jesus admits that heaven and earth is temporary. It's got an expiration date as well, but God's word, Jesus' word, does not have an expiration date. That should bring great comfort to you. Here's encouragements as we face the unknown of the future, including this coronavirus and the things that we're facing today, which are just part of the natural order of the curse and tribulation. The news of the day is normal. So when you're scrolling through your news feed, just say it's normal. Don't be taken alarmed. Don't be shocked by it. It's just normal. Jesus knows about it. He's got a plan. Doesn't take him by surprise. It's part of something that's in within his balance. Don't, don't be alarmed. And then don't, don't allow charlatans to take advantage of this fear in you. There's a lot of pulpits that are filled with preachers who want to just kind of express um, therapeutic deism. They want to be psychologists from the stage. They want to make you feel good. They want to bless you. They want to pet you. They want to cuddle you and coddle you. Jesus wasn't cuddling and coddling these guys. He was telling them the hardcore truth. And the hardcore truth is kind of scary, unless you know that his word doesn't fail and Jesus doesn't fail and that he's returning. That's what you need to know. You don't need to know uh, all these like things to help your anxiety go away and strategies. Every preacher seems to be doing this stuff today. What Jesus would say to you today, what you need to know is that his word never fails. Isaiah 26, Philippians 4. Trust in God simply, ponder him continuously, and the peace of God will provide shalom, shalom, perfect peace for you. Nothing that you're going to do is going to do that. God's going to provide, guard your heart with perfect peace when you fix your mind with thanksgiving upon God and set your mind on things above. So don't be taken by charlatans. Remember that Jesus is the Son of Man. Remember that Jesus is returning. Remember he, his kingdom is better than any kingdom we have on this earth. No amount of politics and, and uh, you know, worry and fretting on Facebook about our political situation is going to make it better. We've got a better kingdom. You are citizens of another. If you put your trust in Christ, you're citizens of a better kingdom. You're ambassadors from another land to this one. And so what are you communicating to this culture? Are you communicating alarm and worry? Are you communicating uh, your, your need to be coddled and petted by preachers? Or are you putting your trust in Christ and his word that doesn't fail? Describing, describing the, um, the kingdom in Revelation 11, you should turn there to Revelation 11, verse 15 through 19. It describes this kingdom and this temple. And it shows that God is going to establish his temple. He's going to establish everything necessary for you to live within his presence. Under the protection of his wings. In his grace and in his mercy. And he wants to begin that work in you. Today, if you have never put your faith in Christ, remember that Jesus has uh, died on the cross. In a few days, we're going to be uh, remembering the work of Christ on the cross. And if you have never trusted in Christ that he died for your sin, you need to begin to put your confidence in that. And if you've heard of the resurrection, Jesus rose from the dead. That's why he can return. He's alive today. He stands as our high priest who can sympathize with our weakness and help us in our times of need and show grace and mercy. And he wants to provide that for you. And if you've never put your trust in Christ and, and begin to trust that he rose from the dead and that he is the Lord, the, the, the priest who can hear your prayer, if you've never put your trust and called out to him for rescue, then today's the day. 
You should consider that. You should begin that and call out to him for rescue. Call out to his name. Trust in him. Know that his word doesn't fail, that he is better than any charlatan or false teacher, and that he is the one that can comfort in the midst of alarm and bring you peace. Listen to these words from this hymn, and then we're going to sing a song called Waymaker. I'd love it if you'd grab your song sheet out and get ready for that. But listen to this word from this song, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. The cornerstone, the solid ground, firm through the fierce drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. May the Lord bless you. Today, trust simply in God and ponder continuously. Place your trust in Christ, whose word never fails and is eternal and has no expiration date. May the Lord bless you today. Amen. Miss 
keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are.